All right. Hey, welcome. I'm so glad you could join me wherever you're watching from today. Uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of Philippians. Uh, we're going to close up chapter two just to look at Paul's writing. And this, as we look at God's word, there's the, the humanness that comes out in Paul in the second uh, part of chapter two. I just want to look at this very quickly before we get into chapter three. Uh, you're going to look at Timothy and Epaphroditus. And as you're following along, as you're listening, I encourage you to circle and write down those attributes that stand out to you of what Paul is commending them for, the attributes that they are, that they bring as partners in the gospel. So let's look at this starting in chapter two, verse 19. Just follow with me or listen. Uh, it says this, that I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who is genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they seek their own interests, not those in Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him to you just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but on me also, lest I, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice in seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ. Risking his life to complete was lacking in your service. As we uh, look into our message today, I just I hope that what you heard were a few things in that closing part of chapter two. One is that Timothy, he was a care provider for, for Paul. They found, he found comfort in Timothy, and he felt fellowship between both of them that uh, these were gospel partners, they were workers, they were committed to the cause of Christ. And in that, you can hear Paul finds great joy because when they would visit, as they would care for his needs, they could fellowship together and be reminded of why Paul is in prison. I'm sure he brought them great encouragement, as I think you can see in the letter. So I encourage you on your own study time, go back, look through the end of chapter two. Um, but we're gonna step now today into chapter three. Well, good morning, and we're going to continue now in chapter 3. So if you want to grab your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 3, as you're doing that, I want to challenge you to be asking the question in the message today, what makes someone right with God? In other words, what gives you and me humans the ability to someday be in the presence of God and currently to be filled by the Spirit of God. What does that take? And it makes me think of uh, my younger days. I grew up in Catholic school, a Catholic boy, uh, attending all of the classes, going to church regularly. And I, and I think in that phase of life, I realized a couple things. I, uh, I knew the motions, sit, kneel, stand, I knew you walk up to the front and we were supposed to contemplate lots of great things about who God is and who Jesus is. And we would eat bread to symbolize his body. We would drink wine to symbolize his blood. I knew we were supposed to confess sins. And I saw my dad, he would fill out a check and put it in the offering plate as it went by. And, and all of those things, I thought, oh, so this is how we're made right with God. As long as I go through the motions, as long as I do the right things, then that means I can leave the service and have found myself in favor with God. And it's funny because as a young child, I had some questions. And I don't want to, first of all, beat down on, I believe there are genuine lovers of Jesus and followers of Christ in the Catholic faith. I just want to be careful here. But I do want to say this, that even at a young age, I questioned a lot. Uh, as an eight-year-old, I thought, why, why do I have to confess to the priest when I thought Jesus was who I was supposed to confess to? I just, I questioned a lot of that. And I want to use that as a platform for us today as we look at this message, because what I thought was, what I was doing was making me right with God. My actions is what it took. And so I ultimately uh, left the, the Catholic Church. My family got divorced. And then there was a season of life where I would say this. 
I think I had the knowledge of God. I, I, I did believe that Jesus was Lord, but I'm going to say that I didn't have the heart for God or the heart of God. I think I, I lived here, but it had not migrated to where the heart really was crying out for God. And I'm grateful that today I can say he is my Lord and my Savior, and I've given him my life. I've given him my heart. And there's evidence that I see. And I want to press in today as you're wrestling with that. What does it mean to be made right with God? The, the writing today is going to make that clear. And so I want to make sure before we jump in, we look a little bit from last week. We were looking at salvation. And Pastor Drew, he covered three key elements of salvation. See, our problem is we often only go to the one moment where we surrender our life to Jesus, and then we think, oh, the rest of it now, I've got to work really hard. And so what Pastor Drew did is he said, um, salvation has three key parts. We have justification, the moment when you surrender to Jesus that you say, here's my life, Lord, here's my life. I call you my Lord and Savior. I want you and nothing else. That we have justification, or we're going to use the word today, righteousness. The righteousness of God is given to us. And then Pastor Drew talked about the sanctification process, that second part of salvation, which if you're watching this right now says you're actively involved in if you're a, a follower of Jesus, that you're in the process of him renewing and refining, hopefully surrendering more and more day by day. And then of course, glorification, that final step where we reach the fullness of Christ in the resurrection. So, I want to just make it clear, we're going to really be focusing heavily in the justification portion today using the term righteousness. You are justified before God. And uh, then Paul, of course, he's going to be pushing hard toward the glorification day that he so, <laughs> so longs for, as we learned about way back in chapter one. So I want to start, though, I had you open to Philippians. I'm just going to have you listen uh, to a passage. I'm going to put it on the screen because I think there is a, a key passage out of 2 Corinthians that helps lay the foundation for our teaching today. Um, and it goes like this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Just lay this foundation with me that we read about in chapter two, how Jesus came down. He, he emptied himself, becoming in the form of a servant, that he, he took on this mission that he says, look, I took death seriously and I was willing, I was willing to die even death on a cross. It says, look, he did this for you and me. And so we see this in the passage that he took on all sin. He died and rose again. He defeated death and sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of Christ. This incredible, people call it the great transaction. And it's a mystery. If, if you're sitting there going, oh, I could explain this perfectly and easily, may God bless you in that. But it is a mystery. How that Jesus says, look, you give me your sin. I give you my righteousness. That's a mystery. And it's a beautiful and incredible picture. And the Apostle Paul today is going to unpack this for us as we look at our text. So first, I want to start off that we are going to be called in the passage to have no confidence in the flesh. Remember my opening story. I had a lot of thoughts about the activity that I was doing. And Paul's going to push hard against that today. So let's get right in to chapter 3 in verse 1 as God unpacks the enormity of God's grace in this gift of righteousness, this great exchange. So he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. And we just, just press for a moment before we get into where we're going. If we don't pause and rejoice in this mystery, if we don't go, ah, oh, and utter, ah, oh, oh my goodness, God, thank you for righteousness in Christ. Paul wants to say, everything I'm going to talk about, I'm going to press hard, but rejoice, rejoice, Rejoice. And he says, finally, not to say this is the end. It's one of those things, you know, sometimes you're hearing a message and someone goes, and finally, and you think, oh, they're about done. No, he's saying, in addition to what we've been talking about, keep going. I have to keep adding on to deepen your understanding of what it means to have faith in Christ. And so he says, rejoice. So I ask you today, 
rejoice, rejoice. But then he presses in. Now he's talking, remember, to the church of Philippi. He's teaching them, trying to encourage them to rejoice. But he also has a caution for me. So he says this. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the, fl- the flesh. So he starts off with this, this incredible, like very harsh statements. He's speaking now, uh, applying terminologies to people in the culture that for the very simple view were distorting the truth of the gospel. What they wanted to do is add to the finished work of Christ to things that we're supposed to do to somehow attain Christ. He's going to add to him. So he uses the word dogs. And first of all, what I, I don't think you want to do is assume that this is what he means. Cuddly, cute. This is my dog, Finn. And, and he just wants to sit in your lap forever. If that's the picture you got when you read this, I want you to realize that is not what he's, he's saying. He's not saying, watch out for those cute little things that want to sit in your lap. What he's saying is this. Watch out for the dogs because they're vicious. They're scavengers. They are lurking and going around. They are impure. They are not the kind of thing that you want to go cuddle up to. And in this context, he's referring, he's using this terminology that Jews would apply to Gentiles. And they would, they would use this as like, you are unworthy to even be near me. You are disgusting. And so Paul then applies this, watch out for the dogs. And he's going to apply this now to people who are professing Christ because they were doing works on top of, that they were taking Jewish traditions and saying, we're going to do this. And then you got to do these too. And he's, so he's, he's talking harshly. And ironically, he's also probably referring to himself a little bit as this is what I was. I was a dog. I was, I was an evildoer. But then he goes on and he kind of talks a little, little deeper, this idea of, of uh, mutilators of the flesh. And of course, in a moment, we're going to unpack a little bit more of what he's speaking to. But just this idea, he says, look, there was a Jewish custom, a history that was, that was passed on to Abraham that says, look, circumcision is part of what it means to be part of the family of God. So there was a physical action that was done to symbolize. And, and what this mutilators of the flesh, one of the things that, that scholars look at is they say, what they were doing was saying, yeah, you can follow Jesus, but first you have to be a Jew. So first, you're going to have to have a physical circumcision on the outside. Then, then you can add to and, and be a follower of Jesus now. And so he's going to press into that. But before we go into Paul's kind of rebuking of this, I want to just have you pause for a second. I want you to think about what does it mean to be a fleshly, confident person? Because that's really what he's referring to. He says these dog, these, these evildoers, these mutil- mutilators of the flesh, they're fleshly confident. And so let's just think about that. What does it look like? These are a few, probably not an exhaustive list, but here's some ideas. I, I think people who are really confident in, in their flesh, in the activity that they do, are often very uncompassionate. It's, it's easy to look down on people when you're pretty high and mighty in what you're doing. So they're uncompassionate generally. They, they seek the approval and, pr- and praise of others. Go around looking for it. Did you see what I did? Did you see this? Have you, have you noticed? Or they contort their bodies. Oh, look, I'm fasting. Oh, do you see how, how serious I take God? They boast of their good works. They condemn sinners. And they reject correction. I think these are some generalizations, but, but use that as a tool and, and just do some heart searching man, am I guilty of this? Like, am I guilty of seeking approval of others rather than that of Christ? I know I am. I mean, I confess that. I I often fall into this trap. I really want you to like what I'm going to say or love what I'm about to do or or go with me and and approve of what I'm about to, to where I'm about to serve. I wanted to, to read a poem and just just listen. Listen to the heart of somebody as, as the, the poem. It's from the Cyber Salt Digest newsletter. But I was looking it up and I read this and I thought, oh man, this hits me hard right here. He says this. and says, I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights or the decor, but by the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash. Can you just hear that tone? 
And there stood that kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. And next to him, my old neighbor never said anything nice. And Herb, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. What's the deal? I'd love to hear your take. How'd all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet? So somber. Give me a clue. Hush, child, he said. They're all in shock at the thought of seeing you. Whew. Do you hear the, the heart of those who are self-righteous? Uh, interestingly enough, is it's clear in this poem, it's clear to me that he's been saved by Jesus, and yet still he enters heaven and goes, <laughs> look at, why are these guys here? Look at what I did. And I think Jesus puts him to his knees in this poem and just says, yeah, they're kind of surprised too. But don't be surprised. See, I'm the one who brought you. It's in my righteousness that you're here. And so we're going to press in now as Paul presses harder. He presses in to say, listen, here's the deal. Remember the evildoers. Remember those dogs. Remember those mutilators. Here's what we are, and here's what they aren't. If we're in Christ, we are the circumcision who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. You see, those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators, says they're adding to what Christ has done. But what I'm telling you is if you're in Christ, you are the circumcision. In other words, it says there in, uh, what was that one I had written down? In Colossians 2, there's this moment where it states that, that the hands of man did circumcision in the old days, and Christ comes in and circumcises the heart. He says he transforms this heart. And he says, that's what you are in Christ. You're the true circumcision. He says, not by hands, by faith in Christ. A, a, a circumcised heart is one that is repentant. It's one that acknowledges Jesus. It's one that has been cleansed, been brought to life. A circumcised heart experiences the love of God because of the Spirit of God in them. And out of them flows love. That's the picture that he's getting at. It's not just a, a, an action that is done to man. This is a transformation work for men and women in their hearts. And that's who we are as Christ followers. And second, he says, and we worship uh, by the Spirit of God. It reminds me of that moment at the woman in the well. And she says, you know, I can't worship where you are and because I'm far from you. And Jesus says, that day is gone. Today you, you worship in spirit and truth. Uh, gone are the days of, of religious seasons where you can worship or locations where you can worship or times of the day or times of whatever that there's not this regulation. It says now you worship because the spirit of God is in you. You worship God at all seasons, at all locations, and you are free to worship, not bound by regulation. And then he says that we glory in Christ. Why do we glory in Christ? Because of the free gift given to us. We can glory in Christ. We are a part of his glory. And we're called to live it out so that his glory in us is revealed to others. And then, of course, all of this is stated in his next statement there. And we put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, there is nothing I can do I can't do my Hail Marys. I can't have my rosary beads, the sit downs, the drinks, the whatever. He says, all of that is duty. It can be good. Gathering on a Sunday is good. Receiving and, and taking communion together, partaking together, eating, drinking is good in the name of Christ. All of those are good, but they do not save you. They should be the evidence of the salvation work being done in you. And so we get to worship in spirit and truth. But see, Paul goes on, he goes, okay, now I'm really going to make a point. Remember those evildoers? Remember those mutilators of the flesh? They want to boast about what they did. So then he goes, let me lay out a little bit about me. He says, if anybody thought they had reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone thinks they have reason for confidence, he said, is it twice? I have more. You think they have confidence? Let me tell you a little bit about me. So remember, this is Paul writing. Paul was known as Saul, the persecutor. 
He was zealous for God. And so here's what he says. First of all, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Eight days old, I was already following the law of what God had placed before us. How many of you can say on the eighth day, I was living out the law perfectly? Eighth day of life. He says, of the people of Israel, my mother, my father, they were Jews. Like I was circumcised. My parents were Jews. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Man, I stood above the rest. My knowledge above all. My ability to memorize what text we were called to memorize, I had it. And then he goes on to this, as to the law of Pharisee and as to zeal, persecutor of the church and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Blameless. He lays it out. He says, look, (laughs) Pastor Jeremy said it this way. He goes, look at me, I was killing it. For those who didn't catch that, that's a slang term for I was really good. But he was also ironically a persecutor, a killer of Christians. That's his zeal. He thought he was on mission for God, doing God's work, and then God got a hold of him. And he said, there's a problem here. He would say this, I worked hard. In fact, people feared me. People knew me. People looked up to me, and I realized the problem was me. I couldn't do this anymore. But according to what I was called to at that time, I was blameless. So we we pause for a moment, ask this question. How are you trying to be counted blameless? What is it you're doing that you think is adding to the work of Christ? What are you doing to try to please God more? Now, is it good to do good works? Of course, we're called to it. But if we're doing it to say, "Um, do you love me a little more today, Jesus? And he would say, I already love you like fully. Like what you're doing isn't making me love you more. Your faith in me, that makes love abound in you. Your faith in me is what matters. And Paul's going to press into this concept. So how are we really made righteous then? If it's not for what I did, how am I made righteous? And the truth is you can't do anything to be made righteous. Christ did everything. But it takes faith. So we'll press into the second point today. Righteousness through faith. Faith is an interesting thing to me because it's, it's that part of me where I'm called to trust fully, to surrender fully, to, to give everything I have to God. And then in that moment, in that process, I receive everything. It it's, doesn't go well with my brain. My brain says, If I want to get something in life, I have to work hard for it. That's the normal flow of life. I have to work hard to get the raise, work steady hard to get the grades. It seems that natural flow of all of our life. And Jesus says, no, that's not what it takes here. This this righteousness, this blamelessness, it only comes by faith. And you have to have it in me. And so Paul's going to unpack that for us to make sure we understand. Uh, First, he says this, Thinking back on his whole uh, lineage he laid out, his resume, he says this, but whatever gain I had, the wealth I had, the knowledge I had, the status I carried, whatever I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. I'm emphasizing the losses here. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I count all, when I compare what I had to what Christ gives me, it is horrible. I love to see it gone because when you see that word to me, the surpassing worth, the value of Christ, when I see the value of Christ, I realize how grateful I am for him and how valuable he is. And when I compare that to what I had, I realize, wow. I thought I had it all, and now I count it as loss. I don't even want to look at who I was. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. A third time he says, look, the suffering I'm going through right now in prison, I count it as loss. It's great. Get rid of all those things. 
It's rubbish. What I'm suffering now is worth it because he says this, in order that I may gain Christ. As I suffer, I gain more of Christ. You see, I don't think we realize, we don't realize the value of Christ until we lose everything and he's all we have left. And if you find yourself at a place where he's all you have left and you don't have him, you will realize the value of him. He is worthy and he is worth everything. And Paul continues to press in and he says, and I desire this to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. He's made that very clear. This was nothing. It was rubbish. It was garbage. I want to be found in Christ, which comes through faith in Christ. And Paul has placed his faith in Christ. It's very clear. He is, he is very willing to lay his life down. He says, look, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I am willing. And then he goes on here, and I think this is where he really presses in, and don't get lost. He says this, to which uh, comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God. Through Christ comes the righteousness of God. And again, he emphasizes it depends on faith. That's how I get it. And then he says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share in his suffering. He is going to press our minds for a moment here. He says, I want to know him. I want to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. I don't want to be like I was. I'm speaking of myself here. I don't want to be the kid at eight years old who left the Catholic church with knowledge. I want to intimately know Jesus. Paul continues that thinking here. He's saying, I want to know him. I want to experience his power inside of me, flowing through me. Uh, so that the gospel is proclaimed. Remember that the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. He says that I may share in his sufferings. He says, look, when I am close to Jesus, even when I'm suffering, I am found closer to him. So I want to share in his sufferings. I want to know what it's like to have the mind of Christ to the point that I will be obedient to death. I want to share in his sufferings. I want to take you for a moment to Matthew 7. If you want to turn there, Matthew 7, uh, verse 21. There's just, this is something that, that it, it keeps my brain focused because this is a pretty sobering moment. Jesus is talking and he's talking about this day when everybody will come before him. Each of us independently will have this moment. And he says this as he's speaking. He says this on verse 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Didn't we do these great things? And he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I think what Paul is emphasizing, he says, I want to be known by Jesus. I want to know him and be known by him. This is my heart. And, and he comes to this kind of final statement here. He says, I want to be like him in his death. I want to live with such a mind of Christ that the thought of death, that I, that I take it with joy and say, okay, you're worth it. The worth of knowing you, you are worth it. And he says, I want to be like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That I may attain this. And, and some of you will quickly go, he's, it sounds like he's doubting. He's doubting that he's going to be resurrected someday. That's not his heart. Next week, we'll pour more over this, but his heart is this. Paul realizes that when his life is ended and when he is resurrected, he will have achieved the fullness of Christ. John Piper said it this way, the resurrection is the final and total gaining of Christ. That as we're in the sanctification process, little by little, Christ is being added to us. Hopefully, as we decrease, Christ increases, and the world is watching, and hopefully out of us flows the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus is not a path to the resurrection. He's the fullness of it. And it all takes faith. If you're wondering about your faith, I want to leave you with these thoughts. One, weak faith does not diminish 
the righteousness of Christ. So if you're struggling today and you've got, you feel like you might be with someone who says, I have really small faith, that, that mustard seed type faith, that little bit, I don't have that much right now. That doesn't diminish the fullness of Christ, the work that he did, and his righteousness is not decreased because your faith today may be weak. And if you're one who says, I have really strong faith, it didn't make it any stronger. See, Christ is complete. So when you put your faith in him, his righteousness is given to you. I want to hand off to our campuses and let our pastors there as they close with you today. Well, thanks for hanging out with me today. I, I, I know this is a, one of these topics. I can't tell you the amount of hours I spent kind of tossing and turning through this message to figure out how do we convey, honestly, what is such a deep, amazing gift called righteousness in God? How do we, how do we unpack this? I would encourage you to continue to pursue what it means to have faith in Christ. And so I wanted to read to you from Luke chapter 18. So if you want to turn there real quick, Luke chapter 18 on verse 9. I just, I thought that this parable, this is Jesus speaking, and it speaks, I think, wholeheartedly to this message today. So let's take a look at that. Chapter, uh, verse, chapter 18, verse 9, it says this, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So Jesus said this, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by him, uh, by himself, prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I think if anything, if you left the message today, if you pondered this, as you leave, turn to turn off your computer to, to stop the message, as you get into your car, as you leave your home today, whatever it is, wherever you're at, I want to ask this question. Have you been made right with God? Is, is Christ's righteousness yours? Or are you working really hard? I, I think this parable is a really powerful one to challenge my heart to say, Am I at the point where I beat my chest and I say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner? I would encourage you to pursue your faith in Christ. Do you have faith in Christ? Because what you will find is without it, all we are left to is ourselves. But with Christ, we have all access to him, to his power in us. And we're guaranteed, it says, that we're given righteousness. We're seen as righteous before God. The, the relationship with God is made perfect. I just encourage you to evaluate your life today. And I want to leave you with these two thoughts. I just want to challenge you to take gospel risks. One of those gospel risks is to put your faith in Christ. To trust God to work his glory in your life. That each day you wake up, and I want to bring back the blessed rhythms, that each day you wake up, and you ask the question, God, you, you go in prayer first. God, use me today. God, I put my faith in you today. Tr I trust you today. Use me for what you would have to do. And just encourage you to listen to L, listen to others as you go to work, as you play, as you meet people and wherever you're shopping. And then eat together, serve and share life with one another. Thank you guys for coming today. I want to pray for you though before you go. Father God, I thank you so much for uh, the message today. God, I pray that whoever is listening to this now, that they would pursue you, that they would pursue your righteousness that can only come to you by faith. So if there's anyone listening who has not yet placed their faith in you, God, I pray that you would reach their hearts today, that, that they would go from intellectual knowledge about who God is or maybe who Jesus is to saving faith in you. We love you, God. We trust you with our lives. And I pray that each one listening today would receive you and experience life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.